Uh, one of the wonderful things about the Lewis and Clark expedition, of course, is the image of uh, America as the Garden of Eden that their journals present. I think one of the ones that's resonated a lot for uh, people over the years reading their journals uh, is the, the image of a, a kind of uh, American Serengeti from North Dakota across the Montana Plains to the Rocky Mountains. And no American Serengeti, of course, is complete without vast herds of buffalo, and you have descriptions of those those kinds of herds uh, throughout the Lewis and Clark journals from the time they reached the borders of Montana uh, right on through the Three Forks and beyond, basically, to the Continental Divide. And then one of the things that lots of people have noticed over the years is that when if you follow Lewis and Clark across the Continental Divide, down into the Bitterroot Valley, and then over the uh, Lolo Trail into Idaho, progressively the images that you get are of fewer animals. In fact, uh, the accounts of Lewis and Clark crossing the Lolo Trail, of course, is an account of people who are basically having to eat their own horses. Uh, once they arrive among the nest perch, they're purchasing dogs uh, in order to eat. And one of the interesting uh, new developments in, uh, in Western environmental history that sort of reflects on the differences between what Lewis and Clark saw east of the divide and what they saw west of the divide has to do with um, an argument that centers around something called Indian buffer zones. If you remember from uh, reading the Lewis and Clark journals, you know after they leave the Mandan villages uh, in the winter, uh, sorry, it's a cat trying to get in. <laughs> Let me to try to displace the animal. Uh, I think that's what's going on. She's going to be scratching at the door here in a bit. Whenever they leave the Mandan villages um, after the winter of 1804-1805, they journey for more than a thousand miles up the Missouri River and never see an Indian. They don't see Indians again until they cross uh, over the Continental Divide and encounter Sacagawea as a band of Lamhai Shoshones. So uh, one of the arguments that scholars are making for the tremendous abundance of animals east of the divide as opposed to the relative paucity of, of animals west of the divide is that those two situations reflect as much as anything else uh, the different diplomatic situation of Indians on the two sides of the divide. Uh, East of the Continental Divide, the Blackfeet for several generations had done everything they could to keep other tribes out of the great bison uh, region along the upper Missouri River. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me get rid of that cat. Gonna, yeah, I think better for us to just, <laughs> just continue at that point. Yeah, you can just go ahead and pick it up where you want to. Okay. Um, it, it, the difference in animal population, in any case, east and west of the divide, a lot of a lot of people are arguing now, uh, has uh, a good deal to do with the idea of buffer zones. And the, the distinction is this. The tribes west of the divide were mostly at peace with one another. When you consider the, uh, the Bitterroot, Salish, uh, the Nez Perce, the Cayuse, and, and the tribes along the Columbia River, those people were able to move freely through the mountain country and the plateau country to the west of the mountains without really fear of getting involved in, in skirmishes with one another. And as a result of the relative peace west of the divide, then animal populations could be hunted throughout that region and were hunted to the point that Lewis and Clark encountered relatively few animals uh, there. East of the divide, however, uh, what scholars call buffer zones existed on, in several places along the Great Plains. And one of the areas where there was a major buffer zone in the 19th century, especially the early part of the 19th century, was along the upper Missouri. In that region, the Crows, the Arapahoes, the Mandan Hidatsas, and the Blackfeet all competed for buffalo. And in those regions where tribes competed for buffalo, you found usually no people living permanently, groups living out on the far periphery of those areas and only making forays, hunting forays into the interior. And often those forays ended up uh, producing skirmishes with other, other tribes. So the, 
the evidence is that the reason Lewis and Clark didn't see anybody from the Mandan villages to the Continental Divide had a great deal to do with the fact that this was a contested region. In fact, on the way back uh, down the Missouri River in 1806, William Clark noted in his journal that uh, after traveling all the way to the Pacific Coast and back, uh, they had uh, encountered larger wildlife populations, as he put it, in regions that are contested by the tribes than anywhere else. So that's an explanation for why so many animals uh, in Montana and on the upper Missouri. Uh, that sort of Garden of Eden uh, look probably didn't prevail everywhere across the plains, but Lewis and Clark happened to travel right through the middle of, of uh, one of the regions that presented this image of America as the garden that uh, we've all absorbed and loved ever since. Well, I think one of the, one of the interesting things, of course, that uh, Lewis and Clark observed uh, is the tameness of, of animals in the West. Uh, they're uh, sort of constantly speaking in their journals of uh, uh, literally having to uh, chase wolves out of their camps. I mean, at one point in sort of a, a peak of uh, annoyance and who knows what particular emotion, William Clark actually rammed his uh, bayonet into a wolf and killed it. Um, so they, they talk a lot about how tame animals were. And that also, I think, has to do with the fact that lots of the animals they were seeing, uh, particularly in, uh, in eastern Montana, present-day eastern Montana, were not hunted very much. Uh, whenever they were in the vicinity of Indian villages, for example, farther down the river, uh, they had very different experiences with animals. Uh, deer that fled from their approach uh, at considerable distances, buffalo that were that acted wary, wolves that didn't really come too close. But predators, by and large, uh, like wolves and bears, were usually not hunted very much by Indians. Wolves were very rarely hunted uh, by Indians in any case. Uh, and bears were sometimes hunted, but more or less in the same way that a Zulu warrior goes out and takes on a lion. It was to prove one's mettle as a warrior. Uh, nothing like... Uh, the later uh, campaigns of extermination by stockmen against bears and wolves. So those animals, I think, would have uh, routinely been fairly tame. But that buffalo and deer and sheep and so forth were uh, often quite tame, I think, bespeaks, uh, once again, evidence of animals that weren't hunted very much and probably uh, that's, a, that's a buffer zone condition that they were finding. What happened to buffalo in uh, in American history? It's one of the great uh, one of the great stories of American environmental history in the West. Uh, and as I've uh, I've said before, we've I think we've simplified it in a way that a close examination uh, simply doesn't uh, doesn't support. Uh, what we've tried to argue happened to buffalo. Uh, what most of the well, the books, even some fairly recently published, have argued is that. Buffalo uh, existed in fairly undiminished numbers until after the Civil War. Uh, and then they were wiped out, however many uh, a particular scholar argues there were, 40 million or 60 million or whatever, uh, by the hide hunters uh, who were killing them for hides for the market in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. When you look at the story of buffalo in the 19th century, though, uh, from a close uh, and considered perspective, especially when you use Native American sources to do it. Uh, it's one of the great lacks, I think, in a lot of the works done up till now is that they didn't closely examine the Native American accounts. You began to, to uh, create a different picture of buffalo. First of all, uh, and sort of uh, fundamental to the whole story here, is that there probably were never at any time in the history of buffalo in North America, 75 million of them, or 60 million of them, or even 40 million of them. And the simple reason for that is that when you look at the carrying capacity of the grasslands of North America, simply speaking, even in times of good weather, the grasslands of North America would not have supported that many buffalo. The best way to do a determination of grassland carrying capacity is to use the agricultural censuses for the 19th century. Uh, the good ones uh, for the West start in about 1890 
uh, and you can look at the censuses, for example, of 1890, 1900, and 1910, and extrapolate from livestock numbers from horses, sheep, and cattle, and fairly quickly come to the conclusion that extrapolating from the numbers of those animals in the West at the turn of the 20th century simply wasn't possible for there to have been upwards of 40 million buffalo in the West. In fact, the grassland carrying capacity for uh, large bovine animals uh, probably was not much more than, depending on the weather cycle, between about 20 and 30 million animals. So I think one part of the story is that we're almost certainly dealing with fewer animals than, uh, than we thought before. Uh, figures, by the way, were pure ballpark estimates, usually derived from someone a scholar saying, well, uh, so-and-so sat on the banks of the Arkansas River and counted buffalo going by for five days and said, gee whiz, there must have been three million of them. And if there were three million on the Arkansas River uh, and you start looking at every river in the West, then, Lord, there must have been 60 million of the things. But uh, those figures were basically just wild guesses. Uh, and so if you scale the numbers back uh, to something like between 20 and 30 million, which is still a lot of animals, I think you start uh, approaching something more like the reality of what the buffalo herds were like. Uh, then when you start looking at all the factors that could possibly have had an impact on buffalo in the 19th century, you began to discover pretty quickly that there were a lot of things that were influencing buffalo populations. One of them is this, a fluctuating climate. We've sort of looked at Buffalo in the 19th century as if the climate were exactly the same on the Great Plains year after year after year, with never a variation. But anybody who's lived on the Great Plains in the 20th century knows that the Great Plains is marked by cyclical droughts that hit uh, significantly enough to dramatically affect economic patterns, human economic patterns, every 20 to 40 years. And when we look at the long history of dendrochronology, uh, tree ring uh, information, on the plains and pollen analysis on the plains and a variety of other factors, it becomes fairly obvious that uh, climate has fluctuated considerably. Wet climates grew more grass. Those climates produced more buffalo. Droughts shriveled the grass and grasses that were hit by droughts, especially droughts that lasted any period of time, uh, produced smaller herds of buffalo. One of the, the great hallmarks of the climate story in North America is that at about the time Europeans were arriving in considerable numbers, a major climatic anomaly known as the Little Ice Age struck the Northern Hemisphere. It seems to have set in sometime around in North America around 1550, and it lasted about 300 years. It was a time of abnormally high rainfall, a time when, especially in the American West, uh, there were probably bumper crops of grasslands year after year. And so during the time when Europeans were here and becoming Americans, and the time when horses were reintroduced to America, when many groups in the West, uh, many Indian groups were adopting horses and becoming Plains Indians, the buffalo herds were really at a peak. Uh, however, the Little Ice Age had to come to an end sometime, and unfortunately it did, and it happened to come to an end sometime in the American West in the 1840s and 1850s. And at that point, you began to see a fairly rapid and dramatic decline in annual precipitation on the grasslands. Uh, and I think it's probably no accident that when you begin to look at the Indian documents, particularly calendar robe histories kept by groups like the Kiowas. One of the things the Kiowas noted in their calendar robe histories were years of many buffalo. And the Kiowas record a year of many buffalo only one time after 1841. Uh, that happens to be the very point at which I think a confluence of different factors, including the end of the Little Ice Age, uh, began to play a role on bison populations. Some of the other factors that were involved in this uh, 
shrinking of the bison herds by the middle of the 19th century include things like this. Uh, horses had been absent from North America for about 10,000 years. They had become extinct during the Pleistocene extinction. Had survived in Asia and Africa, astonishingly enough, but horses had all become extinct in the Americas. When the Europeans arrived, though, they returned horses. And in one of the interesting ecological stories of the American West, horses are able to go feral in the West extraordinarily easily, probably because they are returning to a former, an ecology that they had evolved to. And so not only are Indians beginning to acquire horses in large numbers after the Pueblo revolt against the Spaniards in New Mexico in 1680, uh, the, the Pueblo Indians captured the Spanish horse herds and began trading them uh, to other groups so that within 50 years after that revolt, most of the Indians in the West had horses. But horses also began going feral in the West uh, about that time so that by 1800 it's been estimated that there, south of the Arkansas River alone there were probably 2 million wild horses uh, as early as 1800. In other words, by the time of Lewis and Clark, there may have been as many as three million wild horses in the West, and by that time, perhaps a quarter to a half million Indian-owned horses. Now, the reason this is significant is because horses have, in some ecologies, a dietary overlap with buffalo that runs as high as 80%. So buffalo suddenly, by the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, are beginning to compete with one of their old grazing competitors from 10,000 years before with horses. And horses then, simply by their very presence, began to reduce the available forage for buffalo. And simply by being there, then horses uh, had an impact on the buffalo herds that, in effect, reduced the numbers of them. So that's, a, that's yet another factor that most uh, traditional histories have not tried to figure into the mix. Important. One is the fact that the United States government in the 1830s is busy removing Indians from the eastern United States. They relocate during the 1830s almost uh, 90,000 eastern Indians into what is now uh, Oklahoma and southern Kansas. Many of those groups are located right on the edge of the Great Plains. Uh, they want to hunt buffalo, and they do. And I think the uh, intrusion of almost 90,000 uh, Indian hunters, uh, hunting families, onto the edge of the Great Plains in the 1830s very clearly introduced a, a level of human stress on the buffalo populations that uh, had a considerable impact. Still another, uh, still another impact, although we don't know very much about this one, except that there is all kinds of interesting evidence about it. Uh, is the arrival of exotic diseases of cattle-like animals from Europe and Asia. Uh, those diseases include diseases that many of the herds of buffalo today still have. Brucellosis, of course, is the one that we all know about. Um, Brucellosis might not have arrived early enough in the 19th century to have affected buffalo populations uh, on the Great Plains during the time of the Great Hunt. Uh, some scholars, Mary Marr of uh, Yellowstone National Park, for example, thinks that brucellosis didn't arrive uh, probably um, uh, until in North America until the early 1890s. Uh, and the first evidence, she says, of buffalo uh, with brucellosis uh, is in Yellowstone in 1916. Uh, so brucellosis may not have played a role in the 19th century, but bovine tuberculosis and anthrax almost certainly did. Anthrax, we know, was present uh, in the Southwest as early as 1800. Now, anthrax, of course, can lie undisturbed in the soil in the form of spores, sometimes for decades. And one of the interesting things about anthrax in Africa is that it's usually released into ungulate populations during times of drought, at which point uh, it has uh, usually a fairly dramatic uh, effect on buffalo popu or on, on wildlife populations. Uh, I've suspected for a while now that anthrax probably was in the soil on the Great Plains, introduced by uh, immigrant oxen and cattle uh, 
uh, across the immigrant trails in the 1830s and 40s. And that when the Little Ice Age ended and the series of droughts began in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, that anthrax probably was released into the buffalo herds and may account for some rather strange accounts we have of inexplicable buffalo diets uh, in the 1860s. Charles Goodnight, for instance, the uh, famed Texas ranger and, and uh, cattle rancher uh, in Palo Duro Canyon, observed a die-up of buffalo uh, in the Concho River Valley in 1867. He said buffalo lay dead in the Concho River Valley in an area that was approximately 10 miles wide by 25 miles long. He said there were, he thought, probably more than a million animals dead. He had no idea why they had died, and his speculation was that they had eaten out all the grass in the Concho Valley and for some strange reason refused to migrate where there was more grass and therefore starved to death. But I've thought for a long time that this may be evidence of uh, buffalo contracting some kind of disease. If not anthrax, perhaps bovine tuberculosis or, or something. Uh, those factors, and as I say, we simply don't know what impact they had, but uh, uh, my guess is that probably they were influencing the buffalo herds pretty considerably. And of course, the last factor, and it's, uh, it's the one that I think is uh, perhaps the one that breaks the back of buffalo by the middle of the 19th century, is, uh, is the global market economy and uh, the gradual luring of Plains Indians into the global market. Uh, we've long known that uh, Indian hunters played a role in the beaver hunt for example, uh, in the Rocky Mountains in the 1820s and 1830s. And uh, scholars of the fur trade have known that Indian hunters were involved in providing buffalo robes. Robes were uh, usually taken from buffalo cows, which produced the softest pelts. They were finished by Indian women, uh, which in effect uh, made the labor of Indian women uh, a premium on the plains in the 19th century. It took an Indian woman usually uh, a week to 10 days to, uh, to finish out a buffalo robe. Uh, it's an enormous amount of work to do it, but they were finished uh, very soft uh, with the hair on one side. Uh, that's in fact a buffalo robe uh, over there on the couch. Uh, they became an item in the, in the global market uh, economy as early as the 1820s. And we know that by the 1820s, uh, as many as 100,000 buffalo robes were arriving in New Orleans uh, a year uh, in 1827, 1828, 1829. By the 1840s, the market had shifted to the northern plains. Uh, the Missouri River in particular made possible, especially by steamboat navigation on the Missouri River. Uh, the steamboat, uh, the Yellowstone, made it into uh, up the Missouri River in 1832. And suddenly, buffalo robes began pouring down the Missouri River uh, at a level that's been estimated at probably 100 to 115,000 robes a year uh, during much of the late 1830s and 1840s. At the same time, in Canada, the Hudson's Bay Company realized that they're going to have to trade for buffalo robes, or most of the Indian trade is going to go to the Americans. And so they start buying buffalo robes in the same period. And in the middle of the 1840s, something like 75,000 uh, buffalo robes, I believe. 1844 was the peak year for the Hudson's Bay Company when 75,000 robes uh, were traded to their posts in Canada. What this meant was that Indian hunters lured by the market and what they were getting in exchange for these buffalo robes were metalwares, also guns, uh, powder, and ball to prosecute their wars, uh, and their wars were usually with other tribes, and the wars were often over access to buffalo country. Um, they were trading for those items, the items of the Industrial Revolution. And then if you happen to saturate a particular tribe with the items of the Industrial Revolution, the traders always had alcohol to fall back on, for which there basically was an unlimited demand. Uh, and lots of tribes were lured into uh, alcoholic consumption because of the trade during this time. And so in exchange for alcohol and the goods of the Industrial Revolution, Indian hunters began hunting buffalo for the market at a rate that probably was becoming unsustainable for buffalo uh, by about 1840 or so.
the reason it was unsustainable is because uh, Indian hunters were killing basically uh, for some tribes that we have evidence for, the Southern Cheyennes for example, roughly three times the number of animals they needed for subsistence alone in order to provide robes to the traders. They also, unlike wolves, uh, which preyed on old animals and especially on calves, what the traders wanted were prime robes stripped from buffalo cows. And so Indian market hunters concentrated on cows. And of course what that meant is that you're concentrating on uh, the gender that's capable of replicating the population. And so this focus on cows for the market from the 1820s to the 1840s, I think, is really beginning to produce, uh, almost no question, a serious drawdown of buffalo. And all these factors then are the reason why in the 1830s we began to see evidence all over the place of the fact that the buffalo herds are shrinking dramatically. Uh, you know, one, uh, one of the great questions about uh, what happened to uh, the buffalo after the Civil War has long been uh, whether or not the federal government uh, was involved deliberately in, uh, in attempting to eliminate buffalo in order to make the Plains Indians easier to deal with. Uh, that's one, in fact, that is uh, literally another set piece argument in lots of histories. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, my experience has been in, in uh, talking to people about buffalo, uh, particularly uh, lots of Indian people today. Uh, they, they basically absorbed that, that story completely, that there was a government conspiracy uh, involving the American military and the buffalo hunters, the hide hunters, to eradicate the buffalo in order to make it uh, possible to put the Indians on reservations. Uh, I don't know that that story isn't accurate. It well may be accurate. But, uh, in fact, uh, in a very recent book, one published in 1997, uh, uh, a scholar has argued that it is true, that this is what happened. Uh, on the other hand, I, I guess I feel constrained to say that there is a, there's a lot of, uh, of doubt about that story. And uh, the doubt has to do with, with the following uh, bits of historical evidence. First of all, the major evidence we've had for this so-called government conspiracy to, uh, to wipe out the buffalo has consistently come from the buffalo hunters themselves. And in almost every instance, in fact, I can't think of an exception to this, when you look at the accounts from which this story is drawn, they are basically in the form of memoirs written 20 to 30 years after the fact, usually written in the early 20th century at a time when conservation, especially of wildlife, was a major American crusade, at a time when many people uh, were not pleased about what the buffalo hunters had done. And so those memoirs tend to take on the tone of being more or less apologious. One of the ones that... Uh, really stands out and that is cited in almost every book about uh, the buffalo is that uh, William, I'm sorry, uh, Philip Sheridan, uh, the great Civil War commander who was in charge of uh, uh, the Reconstruction province that included Texas after the Civil War, when he heard that the Texas legislature was debating a bill to outlaw the hunting of buffalo in West Texas, visited that legislative session in Austin and got up and made an impassioned plea with the Texas legislature not to pass this bill based on the argument that the buffalo hunters, in fact, were doing the government's work for them and that, as the story goes, almost every time you see it, uh, Philip Sheridan is supposed to have said, rather than outlawing the buffalo hunt, what you actually ought to do is give those buffalo hunters a medal showing a dead buffalo on one side and a discouraged Plains Indian on the other side. Now that's a great story. Uh, I've been guilty of repeating that story myself as the truth. And the reason I say guilty is because 
just a few years ago, a couple of historians interested in this problem began to look uh, at the possible speech that Philip Sheridan is supposed to have made, and they discovered something rather remarkable. First of all, the only account we really have of it is in George Crook's book, On the Border with the Buffalo. He's a former buffalo hunter, written in 1905 as a memoir. Uh, there's no other account of it. Not only is there no other account of it, but when they examined the records of the Texas legislature, they found no evidence that Philip Sheridan had either made the speech or had ever visited the Texas legislature to make any speech on behalf of any bill. The story seems to be purely apocryphal, and it sounds suspiciously as if a buffalo hunter in his old age is attempting to defend himself against charges that he helped wipe out one of America's emblematic Western animals by saying that the government wanted us to do it. One of the other accounts that the buffalo hunters tell is that the government suppliers at the military post handed out free ammunition to us if we would go out and kill buffalo. Well, once again, historians have examined that one too, and they've discovered to their uh, astonishment that uh, those supply posts for the military not only were, uh, it's almost certain were not only willing to hand out free ammunition to civilians, they even made troopers pay for ammunition when they went out on their own hunts in their off time. And so we have almost certain evidence that stories like that are invented later by buffalo hunters to sort of... Uh, buttress and support their own reputations in a conservation age. Now we do know that, that uh, Grant did veto a hide hunting bill uh, that was passed in Congress. Congress passed a bill to outlaw hide hunting in the territories uh, and Ulysses S. Grant uh, killed it with a pocket veto. Uh, we don't know exactly why he did that although since Grant was a strong advocate of the economic policy of laissez-faire which uh, most of members of the Republican Party advocated in the 19th century. Uh, there are good grounds to assume that he uh, vetoed that bill because he thought it would be undue interference with a Western economy. Uh, but we don't know. That one bears some closer investigation. Uh, we also know that the Secretary of the Interior, uh, Columbus Delano, made a statement at one point, uh, as he put it, he should not be disappointed if the outcome of the buffalo hunt eventually was that it made the Plains Indians uh, willing to go on to reservations. But as uh, I and other historians have pointed out, saying that you wouldn't be disappointed in the outcome of something is not by any stretch the same thing as saying that we have a policy that this is what we want to happen. And I guess the probably the final bit of uh, uh, interesting evidence about this one is that uh, the... Uh, the hide hunters in the United States uh, were able to kill off the buffalo almost entirely. But it took them almost five years longer than it took hunters, mostly Métis and Indian hunters, in Canada to wipe out the Canadian herds. And no one has ever argued that Canada had an unofficial policy to wipe out the buffalo. The buffalo disappeared in Canada because of the market, because of drought, because of competition from horses, because of all those factors I mentioned. And I think they disappeared, the herds disappeared in the United States for the same reason. And I don't think it was necessary for there to have been a secret policy on the part of the American government to do it.